All right. Hello, and welcome to FACTS webinar, Using a Sliding Fence to Move Your Poultry Without the Labor. Our guest presenter is Michael. Oh my gosh, and Michael. I forgot to ask you how to pronounce your name. How do you pronounce your name? Gutenreiter. Gutenreiter. Okay. I'm Samantha Gasson. I had I'd even written myself a note asking how to say that last name, because that is crazy. Um, FACTS Humane Farming Program Manager, and I will be moderating this session. Thank you for joining us. Before we dive right in, let me take a minute or two to do a few quick introductions. Food and Animal Concerns Trust, or FACT, is a national nonprofit organization headquartered in Illinois that works to ensure that all food producing animals are raised in a humane and healthy manner. We accomplish this by supporting humane farmers through our humane farming program, promoting policies that make foods from animals safe and healthy to eat through our safe and healthy foods program, and generally help consumers make informed food choices. Please visit our website at foodanimalconcernstrust.org to learn more about our farmer services. At this time, I am very pleased to introduce our esteemed presenter, Michael, say it again. Gutschenritter. Gutschenritter. Michael and his family own Three Brothers Farm in, oh my gosh, how do you say the town name? Oconomowoc. Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. They graze dairy heifers, sheep, and laying hens on 100 acres. They also help farmers navigate the unique challenges of growing their conservation-based farms. Michael's expertise is in egg ent bleh, enterprises and grant writing. We are very lucky to have Michael with us today to share his experience and expertise. So without further ado, Michael, I will turn the floor over to you and please take it away. All right, thank you. I am going to share my screen. Is that working? Yep, sure is. All right, cool. Well, thank you, Samantha. I really appreciate it. My name is Michael, and uh, I'm really honored to be here. Uh, my <clears throat> Over the past 10 or 12 years, we've We've built our, our farm quite a bit, and we've put a lot of thought and effort into navigating the, the issues around beginning farming. And uh, we have reached out to a lot of people. We have a lot of mentors. And my wife and I have been trying to find a nice, efficient way to relay a lot of that information to other people. So, um, I, I really appreciate being surrounded today by a bunch of people who are looking to improve their farms. And uh, I just really look forward to being able to share some of the knowledge from that I've gained from the blood, sweat, and tears over the past 12 years. Um, anyways, uh, let's get started. Uh, about five or six years ago, I, I designed uh, what we call the hen pen. And it has absolutely changed our our lives on our farm. Um, uh, basically, I, the hen pen is a sliding fence system that still allows daily movement of hens or broilers or turkeys, any, any sort of poultry, uh, without ever having to handle your fencing. So we'll get into why I did it and kind of how I did it. see kind of new slides here there we go so this is just the the video of what it actually is so i'll be i'll be quiet during this So in, in each one of these coops, we have about 700 hens, and it's only an 800 square foot coop. <clears throat> but uh, it's it's not overstocked because we're able to move our birds as much as we want. So the stocking density is very high, but with a lot of movement. We're not doing any damage to the pasture, and we are creating a ton of grass growth. We'll get into here. Uh, so on our farm, we uh, we use 20 by 40 foot prairie schooners, and we have four of those. 
Uh, the Prairie Schooner is the is the actual steel coop, two and three eighths inch uh, rounded steel, and we we carry between twenty eight hundred and three thousand laying hens on our farm. That equates to roughly seven hundred hens per coop in in the summer. Uh, we used to raise a lot of uh, broilers. We used to do about six thousand a year, and we decided not to do that anymore, <clears throat> primarily because we we did build the hen pen and we were able to sell a lot of eggs which is just a much more enjoyable enterprise for us than, than doing meat birds however i trialed the hen pen with batches of meat birds on another farm and batches of turkeys on another farm so we know that it, it works pretty well with with those two and so i'm just going to show this this other video, and I'm showing this mainly because a lot of people ask uh, how it works in taller grass. And uh, we actually graze very, very high with our sheep and our heifers. And it it ends up creating some pretty tall grass. Uh, and the hen pens move right through the tall grass without, without any issue at all. Um, so basically, why did I start designing a sliding fence. Well, when our, our oldest girl was born uh, four and a half years ago, we we wanted to uh, free up some time because I spent a lot of time moving fence and getting frustrated and uh, basically coming home after work uh, pretty annoyed and, sh and you know, I was kind of short with, with my family as I'm sure a lot of people on this webinar have experienced after uh, setting up fence and then, you know, going out and seeing it, it falling down the next day or a bunch of chickens got out. Uh, so primarily we did this so that we could free up time for our family. Um, my toolbar here. Uh, so <clears throat> the, the other great benefit that came from designing this was that we can move our hens as frequently as possible. And a lot of folks will move their hens maybe twice a week or once a week, or if they're in their busy season, they, they just might not move them for two weeks. Um, completely understandable because you're trying to focus on marketing and, and uh, a whole, whole gamut of other things that farming demands. But what we found uh, was that the longer the hens stayed in one spot, the longer that they're the more they're going to destroy the pasture, and hens will scratch and scratch like crazy. So they really they really can kill uh, the the pasture in a hurry, uh, especially at a 700 hen per coop stocking rate or stocking density, I should say. Um, and we're trying to we've been trying to build up our ruminant enterprises being sheep and, and custom grazing for a, a dairy farm uh, and we, we're really starting to see that the less we moved our birds the well the less we moved our birds the less pasture we ended up having on the on the next rotation and uh, that was that was a real struggle because you know we'd have to then feed hay uh, you know three quarters of the way through our our grazing season <clears throat> and so the, we determined, you know, the only the only reason that these hens are staying in one spot is because it's so hard to move. It's fencing. It just it's just very time consuming, and uh, employees really struggled with it too. It was just a real challenge. Let's see. All right. Uh, <clears throat> also, everyone loves chicken, as my wife likes to say. Uh, we have. We have a very healthy population of hawks and owls and ground predators, which we love. Uh, we are conservation farmers. We do not shoot or trap any of these animals. Uh, we encourage their existence on our farm. In fact, we planted 28 acres of prairie for these animals. Um, and we, you know, we plant trees that, that hawks perch in right, right near our chickens. Um, with our hen pen, uh, it, it creates kind of a narrow, uh, a narrow area for the, for the birds. And generally 
hawks will not swoop down into narrow fencing. Um, they they need a kind of a bigger landing strip to to grab a bird and then fly out. Um, and same with owls. So we have we have not been losing. We have not lost any birds to predators inside the fencing. Occasionally, birds will fly over the fencing, of course, and those are the birds that get get taken. But inside the fencing, we've we've never lost a bird. And of course, it's uh, as far as the ground predators, we do have a perimeter fence, so that keeps a lot of them uh, out of our out of our pasture. Um, but we either way, we haven't lost any to uh, ground predators either, unless they're out of the fence. Now, one of the huge benefits that we have seen. This is not the reason that we did it, but uh, a major benefit is pasture health. Uh, the pasture in this picture, you can see on the left-hand side, depending on your screen, um, the left-hand side got away from us, but the right-hand side was grazed by was grazed with a hen pen. Those are the coops on um, kind of towards the top of the picture. Um, but the left-hand side, the the grasses kind of entering an oxidative state. So uh, it's all gone to seed and it's getting brown. Uh, if you let that happen too many times, you're gonna end up having bare spots, the plants die off. If you keep it in a vegetative state, it, it will continue to grow and spread its roots. So wherever we you know, maybe weren't able to hit very hard with our heifers or our sheep, uh, such as on the left hand side, I actually this whole this whole pasture we we might have skipped with the heifers for one one reason or another, but we still took the hen pen over the right hand side and it it knocks down those seed heads and then kind of uh, acts like a trampling effect and keeps the keeps the pasture in a nice vegetative state. Um, so, you know, a lot of people say that uh, chickens can't trample. Well, 700 chickens can trample, that's for sure. Uh, and they only need about 12 hours to trample down uh, 800 to 2,000 square feet and then keep them moving. So they're trampling, throwing down a ton of manure, and then moving on without without having the chance to destroy the, the soil or the, or the plant life. Um, so this is kind of a, this is just pictures of our pasture after the, after a couple of weeks um, have passed since the birds have been on it. Uh, we get a lot of new seedlings coming up on the left-hand side and the sward just really thickens up on the, on the right-hand side. Um, and that is, that kind of growth in a vegetative state is going to facilitate more ruminant growth so we've been able to expand our our sheep enterprise from uh, i think when we started the, with the hen pen uh, we had maybe 25 sheep and now we're up to i think we're going to be at 120 this spring uh, and we still got grass coming out of our ears uh, more about pasture health uh, you can see the this this grass mid-season is up to these heifers bellies and this is after a rotation or two, probably at least one rotation with all of our animals. Um, and when when your when your pasture is growing, and you got healthy pasture, your farm can grow, your business can grow, you can make a a heck of a lot more money. Um, <clears throat> a lot of folks will advise to intercede uh, on on a rotationally grazed pasture, we've had issues with that because uh, because we have chickens. So while we've been advised advised to do that through the equip program, it's been a real challenge because if you if you're going to plant uh, plant mid season or early season, you know the birds have to go over it eventually, and you generally want a year of growth before you're going to graze it. So we really don't intercede at all. And we just found that instead of interceding, we've been able to move our birds more frequently. And we've gotten 
all of our bare spots filling up with uh, legumes and, and pasture grasses. And we've, we've had a lot of native grasses and uh, wildflowers coming into those spots too, which is pretty amazing. Um, as far as uh, drought tolerance for this, this whole system, uh, that's that's been great uh, because we're we're trampling. Uh, basically, all of our animals will will trample, eat high, meaning leaving a lot of grass and dropping a lot of manure, and that alone will cover up all of the soil that that is bare so if you're starting out and you, you have a lot of bare spots in your soil which i'm guessing a lot of us do because pasture management is probably the most complex part of grass farming um the, all the all the trampling effect of tall grass will cover that soil first and and not just dry it out and turn it into concrete and uh while birds it, while if you keep birds in one spot for a very long time, like more than a day, they're gonna scratch it up. If you're moving them at least daily, twice a day, three times a day, like we do, uh, they're gonna be trampling that grass and, and putting manure down, which is gonna encourage more growth later in the season. And uh, there's, no, there's no physical labor involved in, with, with the hen pen. It's, it's wild. Uh, we we wrote a I wrote a SARE grant uh, S A R E grant for uh, for building this hen pen and designing it and uh, kind of toying around with it until I got it to be uh, as good as I wanted it to be and basically we we collected data during that grant and the physical stress uh, just basically meaning strain went from 7.35 down to 1.7 uh, on the on the three different enterprises of the um, uh, turkeys, broilers, and hens, because we, we collected data on all three of those. So the physical stress just absolutely plummeted because we're not carrying fences on our shoulders. We're not setting them up. Um, we're not we're not even really walking, to be honest. Uh, all, all we're doing is hooking the tractor up and moving it for about three minutes, not even about two minutes per coop if you're going really slow. Uh, the emotional stress, which is uh, basically burnout, which to me is a, an extremely important thing, especially now that I have a family. Uh, it went from about 8.9 down to 2.2 and Really, the only reason there's even a 1.7 and a 2.2 on there is because we were we were toying with it and trying to trying to fix fix some of the flaws before we got it nicely refined. So in the last three four months of the actual grant, our physical and emotional stress were under one out of ten. So it was it was a huge game changer in that respect, and in my opinion, burnout. If you're burning out, you're you're not going to keep farming. Uh, at least I I wasn't I wasn't going to keep farming if I had a burnout level of eight point nine. Uh, the time spent moving the hens went from about seventy five minutes a day, uh, if we were moving the fence on a regular basis, down to seventeen minutes a day. And what's interesting about that is it took seven seventy five minutes to move all the fencing and coop and everything associated with the chickens for 1800 birds. But now it takes 17 minutes to move 2800 birds. So the, you know, seconds per bird, it just absolutely plummeted. Um, and very similar results, like I said, for the, for the turkeys and broilers. And uh, that 17 minutes can go even further down if you just, if you leave your tractor hooked up, hooked up to the coops. So I drive mine back to the barn and uh, keep it in, in the barn at all times. Uh, but if you just left it out there and you, all you had to do is hop on the tractor, it would 
that time and go even further down because I measured that timing from the time I turned the tractor on in the barn, drove out, and then got off the tractor. That's 17 minutes for moving almost 3,000 birds. A lot of time with my kid. Uh, the money saved on our farm. So we eliminated roughly six hours of labor per week. Uh, in a lot of cases, we're honestly doing eliminating more like eight to 10 hours of labor per week. Um, we, you know, there are different factors involved in, in that number, uh, including uh, volunteers, uh, staff members, and owner labor. But roughly, you can, you can say you eliminate about six hours of labor per week. And if, if you're grazing for 26 weeks per year, like we do in Wisconsin, at $15 per hour, you can save about $2,340 per season. Um, if you have more, more birds, you're saving even more. Uh, so yeah, pretty, pretty significant in my opinion. And that, that you're, that's money that you're saving. So the money that you can make with that extra six hours, if you were to spend your time writing marketing emails and building your brand, uh, you're talking, you know, you could be making, you know, making as much as you want to make. <laughs> um, more hens and more sheep and more heifers was the end result for, for, uh, made, for designing these hen pens. Like I said, we went from 1,800 to 2,800 hens because it became so easy. <clears throat> Our sheep, uh, we went from, yeah, I think it was about 25. Now we're up to about 125. I'm, it just feels like we could probably have five, six, 700 sheep because uh, we're growing so much grass. And then the heifers were, were basically just limited by how many are available from the neighboring dairy farm. But we do about 25 heifers a year right now. And we started with 12. So, uh, but I'm, I'm sure that once we start grazing our, our prairie, et cetera, we would be able to have probably 55 or 60 heifers, um, especially with all the grass that this hen pen is growing. Hey, Michael, can you um, share with with us how many acres um, we're talking about when you're talking about those numbers? How many acres are you on? Oh, yeah, sure. So we graze our, our hens on about 45 acres. Uh, we have 100 acres, so the, the ruminants go on the acreage that we use the chickens on, which is 45, and then they also use the, the other 55. Um, the other 55 acres are more challenging to get to uh, because we have to cross a stream so we don't take our coops over that. And that's that's why we're that's why we kind of split it up. Um, so factors to consider are uh, gate sizes, trees, and other obstacles. Uh, basically, because uh, if you're using a 2540 schooner, it's going to be more, that means 20 feet wide. Uh, your schooner is going to become 40 feet wide because the, uh, the hen pen actually goes straight out 10 feet on each side. So a 20 foot coop becomes a 40 foot unit. Um, so that's something to consider. So what I have, uh, unfortunately, I've been uh, re resizing our gates uh, on a pretty regular basis, but I've kind of settled on about, I think it's 85 or 90 foot gates. And when I say gate, I just mean uh, an electric wire, um, like a rope wire uh, with a handle. So from the interior, per the interior permanent fence to the to the perimeter fence is about 85 or 90 feet so that I can get two schooners with hen pens through it. Uh, and we don't plant trees in our pasture except for right next to the fence, uh, just so that we can keep our production going smoothly without having to navigate a, a massive coop around, around uh, you know, a big oak tree. <clears throat> uh, but we did still plant 250 oak trees in our pasture, but they're all along the fence lines. Uh, the paddock widths. So yeah, you're going to have to think about 
how wide you want your paddocks or how or how many schooners or coops you can get inside of one paddock. Uh, so we have 275 foot wide paddocks and we use four coops. So I just said that each coop ends up being about 40 feet wide. So that's 160 feet worth of coop in a 275 foot paddock. So that's still an extra 110 feet that I'm, you know, uh, quote unquote wasting. But I, I kind of need that space to, uh, to be able to navigate the tractor, um, give a little bit of space in between the coops so they're not rubbing, you know, fence on fence. Um, I find that that works out pretty well. I think I could do one more coop in there. So it'd be about 200 feet width uh, worth of coop in a 275 foot paddock. But uh, I don't, I, I feel much more comfortable with, with the spacing that I currently have. Um, you can only pull these coops from one direction. If you're not using a hen pen, you can pull them from both directions, which is, which is pretty nice. So that's something to consider. Uh, so you're not just going to be able to uh, take your coop to the end of the pasture and then and then kind of do a, a little like Y turn and and, and come back. So you're, you're going to have to make a big U turn with your coops. Um, the hen pen material uh, does swerve pretty nicely. So those U turns are very easy to make. Uh, and you can make a full turn in our 275 foot paddock. So you can go the, the uh, I guess the diameter of that, of that turn would be 275 feet. However, I, I would feel comfortable going down to probably 220, maybe 200 feet. I've made some pretty tight turns with these and uh, not, not done any damage. Um, if you're trying to do, if you're trying to turn on a dime, you're, you're you'll be disappointed. Uh, it's it's just not not very easy, and things start to kink. Um, so you got to give yourself some space. Uh, it does demand a, a tractor larger than 25 horse, and the reason I say 25 is because that's the tractor that I used to use to move the coops. Um, just the schooner can be moved with that, but once you add on the hen pen. You, you're going to need probably at least a 45 horse. And that's basically just because uh, a 45 is going to be a heavier tractor. So you're really looking for the weight. Um, I ended up buying a 75 horse, uh, old 1967 tractor, which I think I have a picture of. Um, and I got it for like 3000 bucks on Facebook Marketplace. It was cheap. It's easy to fix. Um, it's, it's heavy. It's a pulling tractor. You don't need a pulling tractor, but... A nice heavy tractor does not have to be four wheel drive if it's heavy enough. Uh, and you can get these things for, for dirt cheap. So this is our fleet. Uh, this, is, this is all four coops. Um, you can kind of see in the middle of what I call the yard, which is you know behind the coop uh, where, the, where the chickens are, it looks brown. But I just want to uh, reassure you that that is not soil you're not looking at dirt there you're looking at manure so the the chickens have the chickens have dropped manure there and this is right before a move so i'm about to move them um now that everything's trampled and pooped on and then you know we're going to give it 30 to 30 to 45 days of rest and it'll be ready to go for the heifers so you can see where i'm standing taking the picture over to basically the that the road right before the tree line that's about 275 feet so i have space in between each each hen pen uh enough for the hoses to attach because I, I daisy chain all the coops together with with 100 foot hoses so i only have to hook up one of them to a water line um it just gives you enough room uh to get your equipment through to collect eggs move the move the coops etc um yeah and i try to keep them all in a line like that it makes it very easy to collect the eggs then because you know, you're just going straight straight across the front of the coops. And uh, it also puts less strain on the on the hoses that, that connect the coops. 
Uh, so this is the tractor I bought. Like, like as you can see, it's uh, you know a fifty-year-old tractor. Uh, runs like a top, and sometimes, <laughs> um, you know, I you may you may consider it a disadvantage to to need a bigger tractor, but um, I consider it an advantage because I I could very easily justify to my wife that I that I needed a a sweet tractor to work on. So how does it slide? Uh, basically, uh, this is uh, a picture from the manual that we sell. Um, this is a uh, drainage pipe held together, but with landscape timbers. Uh, I cut landscape timbers about 12, I think, I'm not sure, I think it's 12 or 18 inches long and I join the drainage pipes together with that. Uh, and so it all sticks together. I build some corners and use a, a little bit of simple bracing to keep the whole thing together. And then I mount the fence on top of that. Um, I've uh, kind of refined the, the bracing such that it it's extremely simple. I started out with with stuff hanging like uh, ropes coming off the top of the coop to to hold the whole thing together, and I just eliminated all that, and I ended up just using four pieces of top rail from chain link fence to to keep all the bracing together, or as bracing to keep all the uh, drainage pipe together and in good shape as I move it. Uh, so you can see there, that's the netting mounted on top. And I show the two two pieces of bracing on that side. Um, I actually, since writing the manual, I started adding a piece of top rail to the front, which is on the top of this, towards the top of the screen by the four-wheeler. Uh, I added another piece of uh, top rail there just to add a little bit of rigidity uh, because I did start to make some some tighter turns and and that worked out pretty well. Um, and uh, yeah, so this this whole thing stays pretty taut. Um, where I'm standing is at a corner. Where I'm standing for the picture uh, is at a corner. So it's it's kind of held taut with some um, paracord uh, from the corner post. Uh, this is how it's mounted to the coop. It's just a very rigid, rigid mount uh, made out of two by, I believe this is two by six. Yes, yeah, two by six. I would go wider than that. Um, I, I like to use two by eight or two by 10, but honestly, I, I generally just use whatever's lying around the farm. Um, the, the wider, the better, because and if you can do treated, do treated. I know organic, you can't you can't use treated, um, but you can use cedar. So it's going to sit out probably over winter unless you take this whole thing off, um, and it has the opportunity to rot. So I would use a wide plank that gives you at least a few years uh, of use in it, or go treated. Uh, basically, what we've learned from this journey is uh, the the coolest thing that I've learned probably is the high density short duration grazing, which is AMP uh, adaptive multi paddock grazing. Uh, it's not just for rotating, but it's actually focusing how focusing on how much effect each animal is having on on grass, and then uh, deciding to move them before they get past the first bite essentially so we rotate sheep and then heifers and then chickens and the grass after all of that is still you know eight eight ten inches tall but it's but it can be matted down with with manure and trampling um simplicity is essential i designed this hen pen to be very simple and easy to work with, easy to fix. Uh, I, you know, I, I do little fixes throughout the year because netting netting gets ripped or, uh, you know, X Y Z happens. I'll I'll run into something that I didn't see, 
but everything is it's just such easy easy stuff to work with i just buy you can buy all of the materials from home depot or lowe's or menards um and i just buy extra of everything just in case i need to fix something in the spring um and this is kind of our farm philosophy that uh, small incremental improvements are the best way to improve the farm culture. And, and that's true with uh, employees um, and production. But the occasional big changes like this uh, seriously improve the entire direction of the farm as a business. Uh, we, you know, we are able to spend a lot more time with our kids because of this. And that's the most important thing for us. Um, it's also it also takes away all of the extremely strenuous labor from our staff members. So this kind of stuff is going to create more uh, retention, employer retention, uh, make people want to work here, and it's also going to free up people to um, do higher value, higher value tasks on the farm. Um, and so the first thing that we tackle when we're making improvements on our farm is repetitive labor. So we've, we've taken care of the fences. We've automated our winter feeding. Uh, we are this spring automating our mobile feeding, uh, which is very exciting. Um, and then we're trying to come up with a way to automate our egg collection in the mobile coops. Uh, I know how to do it in the, in the winter coops because they're stationary, but the mobile coops uh, a little more complex, so we're going to uh, try to tackle that next. I mean, I, I have some ideas. Um, if you want to get in touch with me about any of this stuff, feel free to email me. And uh, you can find the manual on our, on our website uh, through brothersfarmwi.com. And we also have a free farmer to farmer newsletter where we try to share as much as we possibly can. I haven't been very good about it lately, but I'm going to get back into it. <laughs> um, and uh, we're just trying to share all this stuff that we've learned over the past 12 years. So people, other people can uh, go through a little bit less blood, sweat and tears and make make more money and enjoy their farms uh, for the remainder of their careers. And that's that. I, so I, I first heard Michael's presentation at, at the APA conference, the American Pasture Poultry Producers Association conference. And I think before you'd gotten into like slide one, I'd already decided that I was going to ask you to do something for a fact because, and then by the end, I was totally sold. I think I went up to you right after, you know, I don't even think you'd we'd left the room yet before I asked you if you would do this. Because this is such, it's just really useful information. And I think there's some scale to it as well. So, I mean, you could still do this on a smaller scale with a smaller, a smaller, you know, building or, you know, I guess housing. And you could do it smaller. You don't have to do it so large, which is sort of what I like about it too. It's very scalable. Yeah, that's a good point. There are also, I mean, everybody's using all sorts of different coops and some people use them on, on running gear, like hay wagons. Mm -hmm. um, and some people are just doing really small hand-built uh, you know, schooner style, but much smaller, uh, the, you know, the manual pretty much gives you the uh, idea and right. you just scale it down very, very simply. Um, and as far as the hay wagon style, there's, there, I'm possibly going to be working with the farm actually down in Illinois to, uh, modify it for those, those coops that are up on wheels. That's very cool. Cause we have a cotton, ours are in cotton trailers. Yeah. And so we're, we're, we're planning, I'll share with you how we end up doing it. Cause we're, we're doing this this summer because cool. um, we don't move our birds anywhere near our layers anywhere near as much as they need to be laid, moved. Sorry. I'm going to go ahead and let you take a breather, Michael. We have a lot of questions. I think we're up to 29. I'm going to launch a poll for you guys. If you wouldn't mind answering it, that would be really helpful. Um, it helps um, helps with us with our reporting and also um, getting more funding for our webinars, which of course is amazing. Um, so while everybody's answering that, um, let's start. Some of these questions I've been watching them, and some of them are um, are repetitive. So we'll we'll if we don't answer your question, it, it's because I I felt like it was answered before, and ask it again if you don't feel like that is the case. So. Um, 
So we just, uh, we've had quite a few questions about, is it, how could you do this without a tractor? How can you do it without a tractor? Yeah. Um, uh, well, the, I mean, the tractor, it, it's impossible to pull a, uh, a schooner, you know, our schooner is something like 3000 pounds. So I'm not too sure that I'm not sure that there's a good way to do it unless you have a, all right, well, now my brain is going, um, <laughs> <laughs> you can, you can certainly use an industrial winch, uh, from pretty far away. I used to use a, a big hydraulic worn winch to move our coops before we had the hen pens. Uh, it was effective and you could, you could probably mount that winch to a, uh, a bracing, like a, a big log that you mount into the ground, uh, probably in concrete, but that's only going to get you so far. Um, that'll only get you going in one one direction. Um, and it, I know some people refer to tractors as the actual coop, like a chicken tractor. Uh, so if, if that's the case, um, I don't know. I don't know how you could do it without that, but I think that there is a way. I think you can uh, design some very simple bracing with the drainage pipe and uh, top rail to just make essentially a square uh, that 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 slides. Um, and you'd it, you'd be able to get that information from from the manual. Uh, it it explains how to make the corners and everything very well. So I think maybe putzing around with that. For, for a few days, anybody would be able to figure that out. And they, you could also, if you've got, if you don't have a tractor, maybe do smaller setups that are lighter that can be moved easier. Because it doesn't seem to me like the actual fencing part of it is that heavy. Am I wrong with that? Yeah, no, you're you're definitely right. Um, there are landscape timbers involved, so those start to oh, yeah. add, add weight, but yeah, it's not going to be heavier than the coop itself. You're not doubling the weight or anything like that. Right. You know, even if you're using like a Salton style, uh, you know, broiler thing that can carry 70 birds. Um, you could even build one of these on on that pretty easily. Mm -hmm. um, Anne would like to know, um, can you discuss how your system would work in a hilly, not flatland situation and or how could it be adapted so that it could be used on hilly land? Yeah, I get that question all the time. And uh, I just say we, we're on hilly land. Uh, we have we have rolling hills on our farm. And I don't know the angle, the specific angle, but we go, uh, you know, we, we bring our coops like, like that uh, across hillsides. And, and then we also go straight up and straight down. And this, the thing about this material that I, that I, that I use, it's flexible it swerves. So uh, your most restricting factor is going to be the coop actually, uh, because the coop is going to probably going to be made out of steel if it's like ours. And going up, a, going up a hillside, the coop will tend to go like that. Uh, but the hen pen itself will kind of mold to the to the hillside. So yeah, we, we do it all the time. Uh, most of our moves are on, on hillsides. Thank you. Um, Kate would like to know, uh, how do you use these in winter and how do you keep your birds warm? You have a separate winter housing for your birds, right? Yeah, we don't, we don't move our birds in snow. Um, we, we, ha we set up uh, 6,000 square feet worth of greenhouse for winter production. Um, and we just leave our we leave our schooners and the and the hen pens out in the pasture. <laughs> you know, actually, that's that's the end of their lay cycle at that point. So we get rid of our birds from there. So the way the way we operate is because it gets down to negative thirty, uh, and we get you know thirty inches of snow out of nowhere. Um, we we bring all of our birds in September, all of our pullets at eighteen weeks. And uh, we buy them at 18 weeks, put them directly into the winter housing so that we can control their, um, 
control the elements better because that's a very crucial time. 18 to 24 weeks is the time that I really, really, really focus on our birds. Uh, and so I like to have them in fresh bedding in the winter housing because that's the same type of environment that they came from at the pullet raising house. Um, and then I keep them over winter in there, get their production at, you know, 90% or more. And then April, I'll take them out to the, to the hen pens. And they, they live out their lay cycle through pretty much until mid November. Uh, and, I, and then I sell my birds live in mid November. And by that time, I will have already had more birds into the winter coop. So from September to November, I'll have uh, well, almost 6,000 birds on the farm. Wow. Which is a nightmare. Yeah, <laughs> not, <that's... laughs> it's not that bad. <laughs> Sounds like a nightmare to me. <laughs> <laughs> how many broilers, Julie would like to know, how many broilers would you put in a 20 by 40 schooner? And um, also how many turkeys? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so what we did was for the SARE grant, um, we did 600 broilers in the coop, which I think is pretty standard for, for meat bird operations. Um, but we decided that it was possible to do more. Uh, we didn't try more, but you could do 750 to 800 um, the, the difference with the broilers is kind of interesting because hens are very active. And in the video, you saw the hens walking behind the, the coop and most of them were in the coop walking. But with the broilers, they're just lazy. So you can actually, but that uh, actually might allow you to go faster. So you can move your coop and the birds and the broilers will stay in the yard which is, which I call it, you know, the, the kind of cape, the hen pen that hangs out behind. And they'll hang out there while you're moving the tractor. And then the birds will just walk up to the feed as they, as they want to. So, um, yeah, I think as long as you have, have enough, enough feeders and enough water, you could do up to 800. And the, so, and if you find that you're having issues with that, um, you can add you can add on to your coop so you can actually take a shade cloth uh, off from the, from the back of the coop down to the back of the hen pen and cover that whole yard with shade and so the broilers will use more of that space throughout the day and you, then you can put feeders out there too and that'll really increase your uh, stocking capacity capability so is, is your experience with broilers, is it Cornish crosses or Freedom Rangers or what 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 have you been using when you're talking about the all of this with the uh with the uh, broilers? What yeah, with, with the broilers we experimented only with uh, Cornish cross. Okay. Yeah. All right. Julie has another question. How hot is your net? How hot? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so this is awesome. Uh, we, our our voltage used to go straight down when we, when we had tall grass. Any wind blowing would just push the grass up against the the fence. Yeah, and uh, we'd have no voltage. We'd have we would literally. I watched fox foxes like just walk right through our fencing when it was on the premier one. You know, whatever the, the biggest charger is, really obnoxious. So now the our fencing is up on the four inch pipe. And so that keeps it completely out of the grass. And it stays at about 8,200 volts when, when our charger wow. is down. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. Um, Julie, Julie actually had three great questions in a row. And she says, this is her last one. Um, what about wind? Uh, what is the effect on the net, on the house? Do you move with the prevailing winds? Uh, we don't we don't determine any of our moves based on the wind. Um, the coop is really heavy, so uh, really, really, really strong winds will turn the coop into a bit of a parachute. But we and we had that actually happen. We had sheep in 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 one coop, and it it threw the whole thing across the pasture. And I used to brood broilers in in these coops. 
uh, with propane and everything. And we got a terrible storm and it, it ripped the entire coop. It threw it like 75 yards across the pasture, cracked open our propane tank and everything and pretty much killed all the, all the broilers. Oh my um, goodness. It was crazy. But after that, we put end walls on both, both sides of the coop and the wind, then the wind can't get into the coop. And so it doesn't affect it at all. And as far as the fencing, it doesn't doesn't affect it whatsoever. And the the um, fencing stands straight up, in even in you know fifty mile an hour winds. It's mounted into the into the um, landscape timbers, and so it's it's a four inch spike into the landscape timber, and it's all braced with steel again, you know. Or the steel top rail against the pipe, so it keeps it upright. When wind has no effect on the hen pen at all. Okay, uh, Carolyn would like to know: Did you buy or build your schooners? Uh, we bought them from from Featherman Equipment, from David Shaper. Uh, we did buy them before the price of steel doubled. <laughs> so, <laughs> You know, we got them for like fifty five hundred bucks, but uh, I think now they're something like nine nine grand. Um, and I, you know, I talked to, I talked to David, the owner at the APA conference, and he, he loved the idea of the hen pen because you can buy one hen pen and one schooner and essentially triple the number of birds that you can have in a schooner just by having the hen pen. So if you were just to use the schooner you can have about 250 birds in there if you don't let them out and if you're moving them like broilers um but if you day range them with with the hen pen system you can have you know 700 birds so the the return uh you know gets you know triples <laughs> yeah and it's nice when they i feel like they're they do better when they have more space especially the broilers we do freedom rangers and they they just taste better, I think, with more space. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, if you're giving them more access to more pasture and more bugs. Yeah. But I mean, the only thing that I I want to emphasize is that you know it there's a difference between giving giving you know one get, let's say you have ten cattle. If you give ten cattle a hundred acres and just let them roam for the whole season, that beef is not going to taste very good. But if you have 50 cattle and you're moving them every, you know, every six hours, that's going to taste better. So they have less room, but moved more frequently. And it's the same with the chickens. You give them less room, but you move them as much as you possibly can. It's the egg is going to taste better and the, and the, the broiler is going to taste better. So it's all about the high density, frequent moving. Okay. Julie um, is, has a question about soil compaction. It seems you don't have much, uh, but do you see any evidence of that um, when it's wet out? Um, only from the tractor. So having a heavy tractor, that's that's the only thing I don't like about uh, you know driving driving the tractor. I love driving tractors, but uh, I yeah I don't like that I'm driving onto the pasture at least once a day. Um, I, I justify it to myself by, you know, understanding that we're making those roots grow, uh, quite a bit. And we're, as soon as I, I feel like as soon as I drive on it, we're also, uh, making the roots like loosen up the soil. So we are adding carbon to the soil, but we're also compacting, you know, a little bit with the tractor. So yeah, uh. That's, I mean, that's what I would have to say. Um, if you leave, if you have bare soil, you're going to have more compact soil, and this system <laughs> reduces your bare soil, without a doubt, and it makes the grass grow much faster. So you can go from, uh, if you used to have say 45 day rotations, you could probably get that down to 35 day rotations, and still have the same amount of grass, if not more. Um, so Lee, I'm assuming this is for the ruminants. It must be. Um, what do you feed during the winter? Um, she, they, he says, or he or she says they get a lot of, uh, snow. They mentioned, you mentioned feeding hay. 
Um, so I think, I think that's what most people would do when you don't have an active growing. I mean, do you stockpile? I think that's maybe that's what he's asking. Hmm. Yeah, we, we don't. Uh, we kind of experiment a little bit with stockpile just to get us, you know, if we want to graze a sheep through through a certain period of time. Um, we have not been able to focus on that as much as we want to, but that's in our future. But yeah, we, we buy hay and uh, keep it in a barn and we, we feed our sheep, we feed our sheep hay. And then the, the birds are in the winter housing. They continue to get, you know, certified organic feed um, on an automated feed line. Uh, we don't add hay to the, to the chickens or anything like that. Um, and I know you mentioned this, but do you have your sheep's nevers ahead of the chickens or are they, do they go behind the chickens? I know you answered that, but I couldn't, I couldn't remember. So, so our, our rotation that we generally go with is sheep go first, heifers go second, hens go third. And they all try, we try to keep them all within two to three days of each other. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is a very practical question. Do the hens ever get caught underneath the supports? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, they don't get caught underneath the underneath them. Maybe for the first week, we'll roll a couple birds, but this this uh, material is so lightweight, it does it does they just pop right back up. Um, uh, yeah, that that's that's giving me some more thoughts that I can talk about. Uh, so it doesn't injure the birds, but it. It might roll them a couple times. Eventually, the birds know that when the tractor is coming into the into the pasture, they're getting fresh grass, and they all run right to the front of the coop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, they're so smart, you know. Uh, but uh, uh, what was I going to say um, about roll? Oh yeah, so if if birds do get out, um, if so, first of all, if birds get out of of our old system. It would require, you know, taking down fencing and kind of scoot, trying to scoot the birds in or whatever we did. It, it was always just a real pain in the neck, catching birds and throwing them back in. What we do now is we actually take milk crates, which we use for egg collection anyway, and we just put the uh, hen pen on top of the crates in like two or three spots. So the hen pen kind of swerves up in spots and then all the hens just go right in there when it starts getting dark out. And so there's no chasing chickens to, to get them back in. Okay. Um, Penny asks, why do you graze, graze the sheep first? Uh, couldn't they graze closer than the heifers? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, so the sheep have are, are less tolerant to um, grazing short because of uh, parasites. So <clears throat> we like to give them the very first bite. Uh, that's that's the first thing. Um, they have less of an impact on the grass. That's the second thing. So they leave a lot for the heifers. Um, and the third reason is that the, uh, the sheep do not like to graze among the heifer manure so the big the big cow pies that are that are left behind um the sheep generally don't go within maybe a foot of of the of that manure which is pretty interesting but the heifers don't care about the sheep manure and uh there's no there's no uh disease transfer the only potential is yonis but our, we have a closed a uh, closed herd of or closed flock of sheep and our and the well, dairy farm has a closed herd of peppers and so we're just not concerned about that. Um yeah so so basically the sheep have less of less of an impact so the heifers have plenty to eat. Um they're not grazing around cow patties and uh and for parasites. And then the sheep are having the chickens last they kind of break any parasite cycle that might be there in the first place. So we are right at two o'clock. Um, can Michael, I want to be respectful of your time and everybody else's time. Are you willing to go over by five minutes? We still yeah, have that's, some that's fine. questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, some of these questions have been asked. Okay, so Anne asks, is the drainage pipe the same as PVC, um, ABS or something else? 
I don't think where I live in the Pacific Northwest, I see I've seen any pipe labeled as drainage pipe. Yeah, uh, it's not PVC. Um, we we've experimented with using PVC in this system, and PVC is vulnerable to uh, UV light, and so it it breaks down much more quickly, and will eventually crack. So if you're dealing with any cold temperatures. Like if you're going to leave it out for the winter and it gets cold where you are, um, the next season it's more likely to crack. Uh, the UV makes it uh, much more fragile, so we don't use uh, PVC. Okay. The drainage pipe is uh, triple wall HDPE, high density polyethylene. Um, it it's used in you know farm fields to to just drain out wet areas. Um, if if you can't find it in in your in your Lowe's or or Home Depot or whatever's near you, I'm sure you can order it and get it sent to you. They come in ten foot length, so there would probably be a freight charge for that. But um, yeah, I don't I don't know what to say beyond that. But it's it's high density polyethylene. Which is so this is table. this is really interesting. I don't even know. It depends where you live, I guess, in the country. But I, I went to Illinois relatively recently. It was this time last year. And I didn't realize that people put drainage pipe in their fields because you just don't do that in North Carolina. So it was it was really interesting to see how people farm differently. So it may be that in your area, you're not going to find that in your local hardware store, but or your Lowe's or your Home Depot. But um, yeah, but thank you. So we we know what that is. And maybe, Michael, if you could like uh, type that in the chat so I can copy and paste it so everybody knows exactly what it is, because it may not be something that's common. Um, so Bill has quite a few questions and I'm just going to pick one of them. Um, so, so he asked, do you supplement, uh, feed your poultry or is it all just pasture? No, yeah, we, we, we feed uh, certified organic, um, grain from a, a, a place with a roller mill. Um, you, you're not, I mean, for egg laying, we would not be getting enough eggs to, to make this a profitable enterprise if, if we just if we just fed them pasture. Um, we have seen a reduction in grain consumption when we move them on a uh, you know once, twice, or three times a day. Uh, but yeah, they definitely need uh, a certain protein percentage. We start them at eighteen and a half percent, and then get them down to sixteen percent for their uh, for their main lay cycle. And then uh, if we get jumbos after that, we drop them down to uh, the lowest we go is about 14 and a half percent towards the end of their lay cycle. Oh, and Travis put a link for that drainage pipe in the chat for everybody. Thank you, Travis. I'm going to ask one last question. Um, somebody I just saw it and it's, this was actually something I had been curious about was so the landscape timbers um, that connect the pipes, are they on the inside of the um, of the uh, 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 the drainage pipe? Yeah, they are. Yep. Yeah, so they're at the they're at the unions uh, of the drainage pipe, and so they you slide them in there and and put the drainage pipe over them, and then you can drill the holes for for your uh, stakes for the for the fencing, and all all of that is is outlined really clearly with uh with pictures and everything in the manual so uh yeah the uh, if you're if you're worried about you know whether the manual is going to be good for you or not it's it's just it's 27 pages of, of pictures and detailed descriptions of how to uh how to build this thing um so it'll it'll save you uh it'll save you a lot of headache that, that i already went through <laughs> yeah yeah. All right. So we do have a couple of quick announcements. Next week, we're very lucky to have Trees for Graziers with us to share how creating a silver pasture doesn't have to cost you a fortune with silver pasture on a shoestring. I have a few housekeeping items to share before we, we sign off a recording of this webinar and the slides. In addition to some of the things that we've shared and Travis's link to that, uh, to the drainage pipe uh, will be available to you probably later on this afternoon. 
Um, we have some, we're coming to the end of our webinar season. We've got a few more left to go. Um, and you can see those there on your screen. Um, a sincere thank you to Michael. It's been a pleasure. And finally, I'd like to thank everybody out in the audience for their interest, attention. And you guys gave us really good questions. So I appreciate that. Um, I hope that you had a good experience today and that you will stay in touch. And uh, we will see each other again soon. Thank you so much. And thank you, Michael. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye for now.